Waveguide Introduction. In this video, I'm going to describe what is a waveguide, give a bunch of examples of waveguides, and then in later lectures, we'll start analyzing the waveguides rigorously. What is a waveguide? In the simplest of words, a waveguide is simply a pipe for electromagnetic energy. It is somehow confining its propagation. Here we're looking at a picture of a metal waveguide. This is typically used for lower frequencies like radio frequencies. And on the right, we're looking at optical fibers used to guide light. Light is an electromagnetic wave, just a very high frequency electromagnetic wave. So what is the real purpose of a waveguide? Well, suppose we want to get electromagnetic energy from point A to point B. If we push that electromagnetic energy just out into air or outer space, that energy will spread as it propagates and in many different directions, not just toward the point B. And so we end up losing all of the energy that does not make it to point B. What if instead there was a way to confine that electromagnetic energy to a single path? Well, that electromagnetic energy would then travel from point A to point B without spreading, and we could get almost all of that energy to point B. I say almost because there's probably a little bit of material losses involved in that waveguide, and it would decay slightly. But for the most part, we can get all of that energy to point B much more efficiently if it is guided. There are generally two types of waveguides. One is called a slab waveguide. And a slab waveguide, think of it as an infinite sheet or an infinite slab of material. And a slab waveguide will confine electromagnetic energy only in one direction. So in the other two directions, it's free to spread out and to propagate. In contrast to that, is a channel waveguide. Think of this as more of a tube or an actual pipe. This confines energy along two axes and leaves it free to propagate along the third waveguide. It's really this channel waveguide that we think about most when the word waveguide is mentioned, but we definitely also have to include these slab waveguides. They do have important applications in electromagnetics. There's this word mode, modes in waveguides. The electromagnetic fields have to follow rules. They have to obey Maxwell's equations. And in the context of a waveguide, this means the electric and magnetic fields can't take on any configuration that they want to in the cross section of that waveguide. And instead, there's only discrete ways that the electromagnetic fields can configure themselves. Each discrete configuration is called a mode. And here we're looking at modes that would happen in a metallic circular or cylindrical waveguide. Here's a pretty decent map of all of the different waveguides. And in general, waveguides include transmission lines and what I would consider pipes that are not transmission lines. Most of the time when a person says waveguide, they're really talking to the types of waveguides that are not transmission lines. Let's remember what a transmission line is from previous lectures. It is a waveguide in every sense. It's a special case of a waveguide. A transmission line has at least two conductors. This means it can conduct a mode all the way down to DC. We tend to think of transmission lines as circuit elements and not really waveguides, and we tend to treat them like that, but they're absolutely waveguides because they support a whole bunch of different modes and have all of the properties of waveguides. So let's reserve the word waveguide then for everything that is not a tra transmission line, even though it's a little bit incorrect because transmission lines are waveguides. Then we can also roughly divide this into metal shell pipes. This is where the rectangular waveguide would come in or the cylindrical metallic waveguide we just looked at. There's also dielectric pipes. 
And each of these could be channel waveguides, slab waveguides, the dielectric and materials in these things can be homogeneous or inhomogeneous. And it turns out if the dielectric is homogeneous, those types of waveguides can support TE and TM modes. No waveguide that is not a transmission line can support a TEM mode where both electric and magnetic fields are completely transverse to the direction of propagation. That's solely for transmission lines. But waveguides that are not transmission lines can support TE and TM modes. One sort of exception to this, and here we'll look at a waveguide that has a uniform axis where the dielectric is uniform along an axis. This still can support TE and TM modes. So for the next few lectures, we are going to restrict our conversation to the waveguides that are not transmission lines. And just to remind you, when a person says waveguide, typically they are talking about the types of waveguides that are not transmission lines. Some notes on transmission lines. Trans to be a transmission line, it has to have at least two conductors. Transmission lines, at least for their lowest order mode, there is no cutoff frequency. These work all the way down to DC, which is why we tend to think of them as circuit elements and not really waveguides. Transmission lines can support TEM, TE, and TM modes when the dielectric is homogeneous. Transmission lines support all of the higher order modes, just like waveguides, because they are waveguides. So they support things in addition to just TE, TEM, and T TM. I already mentioned these serve more as a circuit element than a we, we, we tend not to think of these as a wave type device until we get to very high frequencies. Transmission lines are very compact for low frequency signals. They're very often many thousands of times smaller than the wavelength itself. When we get to very high frequencies, and let's say approaching 10 gigahertz or above, transmission lines start to become very lossy. And in fact, the the types of waveguides that are not transmission lines are preferred for those higher frequencies. And as we push to super high frequencies, we don't even like using metals and we prefer dielectric waveguides. That's why optical waveguides are almost always dielectric. Some notes on the metal pipe type waveguides. These contain only a single conductor. If there was a second conductor, it would be a transmission line and not a metal pipe waveguide. These have a low frequency cutoff. So there is a certain frequency below which nothing can get through that waveguide. If the dielectric inside the waveguide is homogeneous, they will support TE and TM modes. A metal pipe waveguide will never support a TEM mode because that was required to be a transmission line to support that. In this case, the fields are confined completely inside the waveguide. And that's in contrast when we talk about dielectric waveguides where they could actually extend outside the core of that and have these little evanescent tails. That doesn't happen in a metal waveguide. They're completely confined to the inside of the hole going through the metal. For really high frequencies, uh, super high microwave frequencies getting into terahertz, these are less lossy than transmission lines. But as we start to push you know, millimeter terahertz kind of frequencies, we start to prefer even dielectric waveguides to avoid the metals. For very low frequencies, while these would be low loss, they become very large and cumbersome and this is where transmission lines are preferred. So you can think of it as a sequence for very low frequencies as transmission lines, and yeah, maybe somewhere above 10 gigahertz, we start looking at metal pipe waveguides, and then somewhere maybe in the millimeter wave, the terahertz wave, we tend to transition to dielectric waveguides. Although you can find all kinds of exceptions at all frequencies. Some notes on dielectric waveguides. 
Dielectric waveguides do not contain any metals. They are dielectric only, like solid glass or silicon, silicon carbide, some of the optical materials. This is interesting and not well known, but if the dielectric waveguide is symmetric, it has no cutoff frequency. So a strand of hair in outer space, if it was straight and absolutely absent of imperfections, would guide a 0.001 hertz wave. Now, if there's any sort of bump or hiccup, that wave would scatter. It's not stuck to that hair very strongly at all. But it is interesting to note that there is no cutoff frequency for symmetric dielectric waveguides, like an optical fiber. If there's symmetry, so slabs that are uniform along a direction or a, a something cylindrical where the material properties have that cylindrical symmetry, those can support TE and TM modes. Most modes in dielectric waveguides, except the lowest order mode, will have a cutoff frequency below which waves can't propagate. The only exception is the lowest order mode for symmetric dielectric waveguides. All the other ones will have a cutoff frequency. Hybrid modes, which is not a word I like to even use. This just means it's not TE and TM. It's a mix. So I tend to like to call these full wave modes or full vector modes, but they contain all six field components. In a dielectric waveguide, even though they contain all six field components, they tend to be very strongly linearly polarized. And this leads to some ways that we can approximate that and simplify the math to analyze them. Optical fibers are great examples of dielectric waveguides. There are many more kilometers of optical fibers installed in this world than any other type of waveguide. And in a dielectric waveguide, in contrast to the metal pipe waveguides, the field does extend a little bit outside the core, and those are called the evanescent fields or evanescent tails. I can roughly throw out there, it extends about a wavelength into the cladding region. That's the region outside of the core. Let's talk about some examples of different waveguides. For optics, we tend to look at waveguides that are compatible with our manufacturing techniques. And so we tend to do these by lithography. There is the stripe waveguide, which will have a substrate and then a high index stripe of material that would serve as the core and the light would be guiding down this stripe. If there's some kind of diffusion process going on, maybe you're also making P and N or doping P and N, making P N junctions. So you can diffuse and actually cause a high index region and this could function as a core as well. We could have a buried strip where you deposit a high index material and then on top of that, some low index material. This is called a buried rib waveguide. Over here is called a rib waveguide where you're depositing multiple layers, but you still sort of have this stripe going down serving as the main core. And then a strip loaded waveguide. And again, it's not so much that any one of these waveguides would perform better than the other. It's probably that you're doing other things on that same substrate and you're going to use the waveguide that's compatible with whatever other process you're using. For radio frequencies, there are all kinds of channel waveguides. An isolated wire, that is a waveguide. Twisted pair, this is a waveguide. This used to be used for telephone lines, the cord going into old telephones. A very well-known one is a rectangular metal waveguide. That tends to be used for higher frequencies. A coax. A coax cable is a waveguide. There's the shielded pair, which actually has two conductors in the middle and a conductive ground on the outside, and the regular coaxial cable that has a ground on the outside and a single conductor in the middle. These are all used for low frequency, radio frequency types of signals. Channel waveguides, specifically for electric circuits. So here we're talking about transmission lines, and these tend to be thought of more as circuit elements, but there's a microstrip, or there's a ground plane on the back of your, your circuit substrate, 
And the little traces here carrying your signals forms a microstrip, which is a waveguide. Parallel plate transmission line. So two strips, it's buried in the dielectric, but you can't see that it continues off in the, the Z direction or the direction into the screen here. But parallel plate transmission line. A strip line. A strip line is really a microstrip that has dived down to an embedded layer and then is routed in between layers. This could be a power plane and a ground plane or something like that. There's the slot line where you just have two conductors and the field establishes itself in the region between the conductors. And then a coplanar line where there's a signal line and then two ground conductors on either side. Sometimes there's also a ground on the back side. These are all very common kinds of transmission lines. Then I'm gonna be probably the only one you'll hear throw this in to guided waves, and that's a surface wave. But the physics that leads to guided waves is really the same that leads to surface waves. And if you develop a simulation of a of a waveguide, you can use that same code to model surface waves because the physics is the same. So I really tend to think about surface waves as a form of a slab waveguide mode. But there's various kinds of these. There's the surface plasmon polariton, which couples an electromagnetic field to a bulk oscillation of electrons in a metal. There's a really interesting kind of surface wave called a Dakhanov surface wave. And this is one that exists between the interface of two dielectrics where at least one of them is anisotropic. And there's some other little requirements in there to support a surface wave, but that's a very interesting type of surface wave. At the surface of periodic structures like photonic crystals and band gap materials, very often we can get block surface waves. A whole bunch of different types of surface waves. Uh, I'm not doing a comprehensive review of these here, but I like to lump surface waves in with guided waves. Let's finish with some basic notes on waveguides. Anything that pipes electromagnetic energy along to limit its radiation can be considered a waveguide. When we say waveguide, this tends to refer to the types of waveguides that are not transmission lines. Waveguides support an infinite number of these discrete modes. Why an infinite number? Because you can always go to a higher and higher frequency and see more and more modes. Most of those modes have cutoff frequencies. The cutoff frequency is the frequency below which that mode would cease to be supported in that waveguide. Now I have to say most modes because there are cases where there is no cutoff frequency. For example, the TEM mode in a transmission line and the fundamental load in a, the fundamental mode in a symmetric dielectric waveguide. Thank you very much for making it through this video. I hope you like this learning style, this visual type of learning style. I would invite you to visit the course website so you can get links to the latest versions of the notes and videos. Very often I'll make revisions that are in the notes but don't quite make it to the videos. And also check out my new book if you're interested in getting started in electromagnetic or photonic simulation. It is intended specifically for the beginner.